there are a few chapters as well known as the chapter we're going to talk about today. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter. And so chances are, if you've gone to a wedding, um, you have heard this chapter. Um, it is used multiple times in, in many weddings because it is so poetic. It is beautiful. And it's this, this image of love and what it is and what it isn't. And, and Paul writes that to the Corinthian church. And so we're going to look at that text today um, as part of our um, sermon series as it's leading us up to Pentecost. Uh, which, by the way, that'll be, I think, the 31st of May. And as we look at the love chapter, um, there are some beautiful things, but some things that we probably need to figure out first. When we use it in a wedding, it's typically used right at the time when everything is well. And at that time, it's before the I do's. Everyone's still in love. Everything is still easy. You know, marriage is this beautiful thing that you're jumping into and so it's it's done in the time when everything is fair and easy and then chapter 13 is really written in the time period after you got married and when you're trying to figure it out and you're struggling and you're saying am i really stuck to a life of this that's really the context that 1 Corinthians 13 is written in. And so as we as we begin to look at some of the text around it, I want you to notice that chapter 12 and chapter 14 are dealing with spiritual gifts. Paul is, is discussing this idea of, of people who are uh, speaking in tongues, who are prophesying, uh, and how they feel that their gift is elevated in comparison to other people's spiritual gifts. And so at the ending of chapter 12, uh, verse 31, but earnestly seek the higher gifts. Uh, and I will show you uh, still a more excellent way. So Paul is, is acknowledging at the end of chapter 12 that chapter 13 is not this isolated chapter on love and romance and beauty, but it's on how the spiritual gifts should be used. What does it take for, for the, the God-given gift to be utilized in a way that's appropriate and beneficial? So as we're coming from chapter 12 into chapter 13, looking at what all's going on here, we, we have to realize that Corinth is dealing with struggles. Uh, we studied a little bit about that last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 and following, and the, chap the book opens up. This idea of some people saying, well, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, um, and then I follow Christ. And Paul's comment was, is Christ divided? So even at the beginning of the book, we are introduced to this idea of division occurring in the church. That division is still going on, except now it's going on a different way. So previously, you had people who were saying, well, I follow, this is my favorite preacher, and I'm going to follow him. And then chapter 12 comes in where people are saying, well, I can do this. Um, and Paul says, wait a second, you, you got this all wrong. It's not about what the spiritual gift is. It's about how you utilize that spiritual gift. And, and now that I'm entering into chapter 13, let me tell you the ways that are, that are appropriate and beneficial and really the greatest spiritual gift. So there was this great division going on in Corinth. Uh, it, it, it could be the division of rich and poor. It could be the division of slave or free. It could be the division of um, Jew and Gentile. There are so many divisions occurring and everyone, whether, you know, so whether it is uh, an ethnicity, whether it is socioeconomic class, whether it is on the spiritual gift realm, who baptized whom. Um, Corinth is just a divided church. And so chapter 13 is not written as an ode to love. It's written as a call to action. Paul is calling the church to step up into a place where God is calling them to be. And that their response is purely dependent upon how they view their spiritual gifts and the supremacy of love as the greatest spiritual gift. Now, this isn't the only time that Paul has used 
um, this idea really in chapter 13 and other places. I'm thinking about verse 13 where it says, Now abideth faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. That, uh, that Trinitarian form there is not unique to just 1 Corinthians 13. Paul uses it in 1 Thessalonians as well. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, um, verse 3 Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. A similar phrase is used yet again in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But you'll notice in the 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians account, the order of faith, hope, and love is given differently. It's faith, love, and hope. Paul's use of these three words in both 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians tells us something about what he's trying to get the message across. And that is that the last word he uses is the key word that that church needs. So in 1 Thessalonians, uh, to the church in Thessalonica, they needed hope. And the idea of a hope of a resurrection, the hope of the Lord coming back, all of this hope message is prevalent to the letter to Thessalonica. In 1 Corinthians, the church in Corinth, the idea of love is the message most needed. So they were very strong in their faith and in their hope, but they were deficient in their love for one another. Now, when Paul uses the word love in this chapter, it is not the ushy-gushy, I feel good, warm and fuzzy kind of love. Uh, not to diminish that, not to say anything less than that, but the love that Paul is, is using is the kind of love of sacrifice, the love that's willing to give. This is the kind of love that changes diapers um, in the wee hours of the morning, and you've told your spouse, you stay in bed and get some more rest. I've got, I've got the diaper duty this time. This is the kind of love that watches that same child learn to walk and helps them in that process, or the same love that holds the bicycle seat as they learn to pedal and you're breaking your back while you're running with them to, to teach them to ride a bike. This is the same love that attends all the sporting events, all the cheer competitions. This is the same love that packs them up to send them off to college, to send them to trade school, to watch them go into life. This is the same love that prays for, cares for, and is concerned for those that are closest to us. This is the kind of love that goes from chapters of life and transcends each chapter. It shares the joys and it shares in the sorrows. And this is the same kind of love that when we reach that final chapter of life is holding our hand as we move into the next chapter of the soul. That is the love that Paul's talking about. It's an undying love of companionship, camaraderie, of a person that's walking alongside you in life. So when Paul uses love here in 1 Corinthians 13, it's not the I feel like I'm in love kind of feeling. It's the love that says, I will not let you go. So as we think about what 1 Corinthians 13 is written in the context of, it's written in the context of a divided church, of a church that is, is just continually fighting over who is best, who, who is, is more spiritual, who's more holy, who's, who's more whatever. They've really placed the works-based ethic on themselves. So instead of looking at it from that perspective, we're seeing a church of division, and Paul is writing with this idea of love. Stick to what is the greatest spiritual gift. We put those two together, and I, and I want to try and make a modern application for us. We spoke last week about division within our world, uh, within our society. We talked about um, some various areas that we as a church probably should be more attuned to. Some areas that we may not see, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. And for the sake of not repeating myself, I want to pick a different area where we may be divided on. 
Um, this is an area where I think that division has caused us to hear the message of love even more prevalently. And maybe that's the message we need to embrace more now because of this. Is it possible that we've been divided by a virus? That our love and our ability to love has been hindered by this COVID-19? We had a gentleman come to the church building the other day whose car had overheated. And as he came to the building, he was afraid to knock on the door because he didn't know if someone would welcome him in or how he'd be received. He had this fear because of what the news media or what whoever has told him. Maybe it's the fear of what other people have even said and done. But he had this fear to ask for access to a water hose so that he could get some more water for his car. Is it possible that the virus has caused us to stop loving people? Because I think about that man, and I think about his fear, and I think about what was going on in his mind, and I see a world of people who are probably in the same boat as he is. They're afraid to ask. They're afraid to go near. They're afraid to touch. Because who knows if I have it or if I could pass it on. Who knows if I'll get it from this person that I touch. And is it possible that this virus has stopped us from loving the people whom we're called to love the most? And then from the opposite side, or maybe not the opposite, but the, uh, the same side, I'm showing love by keeping a distance. I'm expressing my love and my appreciation and my desire for your well-being by maintaining some sense of distance. We as the people of God sit in this weird position where God calls us to love people and where division is to be no more, where there is no, there's no sense of I'm better, my faith is stronger, your faith is stronger. Um, there's only love. And as I look in the world today, I see some of our Facebook posts. I see some of our comments. I see some of the videos that are made. And I realize we're very divided on this topic. I turned the news on the other day for the first time in a while. I don't make it a habit of watching the news. And I turn it on and I realized that it doesn't matter where you go, to the high ups or to the low downs, everyone is divided over what to do and what to do next. We have great division because of this virus. But the message that Paul gives is a message not necessarily of the division, but it's the message of how to overcome the division, that the division is overcome through love. If I love you, then I will do the things to protect you, to provide for you, to care for you. And I want to encourage you, as well as myself, that in the midst of a COVID-19 world, that it is not a matter of who says what, when, why, how, or where. But it's the matter of, am I loving people the way that God has loved me? Am I forwarding that love to others? That's what our charge is. And I believe that in the midst of a divided world, much like Paul writes, the greatest gift that we can give is not the expertise of others, is not the ability to even heal, as blessed as that gift may be. The best gift that I can give is the gift of love in whatever form and whatever fashion that gift may be for that person. Now, if you'll give me just one minute, I, I would like to speak to the seniors. Uh, today is Senior Sunday. And I know this is a little bit of a different form of a Senior Sunday. Um, we're not calling you up front right now to give you a Bible or to give you uh, whatever your gift is. 
for those of you who graduate um, high school, um, you'll you typically have a reception at this time. That's being pushed off, by the way, but I want to use 1 Corinthians 13 as a form of encouragement for you. If you look at verses 1 through 3 of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is talking about um, this idea of, of speaking in tongues of men. If I, if I can do some of the most lofty things in all the world, but I don't do those things with love, I'm really quite pointless. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the phrase that Paul is saying that life, as we typically call it, the human things we chase after are meaningless. If I chase after the ability to do something or the ability to be great at something, but I don't do those things with love, I've missed the mark. What Paul is saying the things that we chase after typically in life are the things that really do not matter. If you were to ask your grandparents or your great grandparents, if they're still living, what's the most valuable thing in life? What's the one thing that you should pay attention to? I'm going to guess that they're going to put their, their vote on either one of two things, God, and family. Warren Buffett, who is one of the wealthiest men alive, has a phrase where he'll basically say, you can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have someone to share it with, you've really quite lost. You've really lost. And that you should not sacrifice um, earthly gains, uh, physical gains, for the loss of your family. You have been given a true gift you may have been robbed of the ending of your senior year at school, but you have also been given the gift of spending the last few months with your family, spending it with those who truly matter, who truly do care, those who've changed your diapers, those who've attended every sporting event, and those who've gone above and beyond so that you could have anything and everything in life. And even when you go to college or you go to trade school or you enter into that next chapter of life, whatever that next chapter is for you, that the most important thing are the people that you spend it with and the God that you serve. Paul uses this phrase in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 13 where he basically says, I... When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. What Paul is alluding to, and, and he's doing it for a different purpose, but I'm going to use it for a senior Sunday purpose, is that the things that really matter in life, when I was younger, I didn't see them. I was always chasing after money or I was chasing after something. I was chasing after a trophy. I was chasing after some form of success. And maybe still today, I find myself chasing after some form of success. But what Paul's comment in verse 11 is, is that as I've grown, as I've changed, I see the things that truly matter and I've begun to place the importance on those things. You see, we spend our lives chasing the things that don't really last. What Paul is encouraging us here, encouraging all of us, is to realize that the things that really matter are faith, hope, and love. Those are the things that really matter in this life. Your family is very important, so please don't, don't undermine that. But the things that truly matter are faith, hope, and love. Gifts of prophecy, gifts of healing, gifts of speaking in tongues, gifts of whatever, those things are trivial in the comparison of spiritual gifts. If you have not love, you have them none. Faith, hope, and love. When I look at those three words, I realize that Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 would tell us that faith is a gift from God. 
It's something that's bestowed to us, given by Him for our ability to then believe and have faith in Him. That hope is something that is given to us by the Holy Spirit. A hope in a life to come that the Spirit gives us through a guarantee, through the sealing of ourselves, that we then look forward to the resurrection. That's where hope comes in. And finally, in love. That love was yet again a gift of God through the person of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so even in looking at faith, hope, and love, I realize that these are gifts of God given to you and to me to make life exactly what it should be. So my encouragement for us all as brothers and sisters in Christ is to search diligently in our life for the things that truly matter, the things that transcend time, that go beyond into eternity. And that in the middle of a COVID-19 season of our lives, that we can express what is the greatest gift, the gift of love. And may you be reminded, and may you remind others, that there is nothing in all of creation, neither height nor depth, that can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Will you please bow your heads and pray with me? Dear God, I'm so thankful that we can come to you now. I ask that you help us during these interesting times that we find ourselves in to not lose our focus on you or forget how blessed we are. Help us as we get through these tough times. Help us to focus on you and your word and your love. Help us to more, now more than ever be the examples of your love and light in the world that we need to be. Help us to spread your message of love and, and understanding throughout all, everyone we come into contact with. Please help us to grow stronger in you and to be ever vigilant in looking out for others and trying to help those who we can and just being the best Christians that we can be. In Jesus' name, amen.